Let's get started. So, this doesn't have much, uh, I, I keep on changing the names around, so I don't know what it's actually called for the, officially, but I call the Gold Puppy at sea. Um, there are going to be a lot of pictures in this, a lot of pictures. It's crammed full of pictures, actually. If there's any picture you want me to talk about in particular, just raise your hand and let me know. I try to mention where all the pictures are from uh, in part of it, like the upper left hand corner or whatever, so if you want to know. Um, let's, uh, let's begin. All right, so let's start out very briefly with uh, me. Uh, my name is Christophs. I don't develop for any of the BSDs. I'm kind of exterior to everything, more or less. Um, I've done a bunch of projects, but this is not about any of those projects. This is about diving. Um, I live in Malta. A lot of the pictures you're going to see are from there because I dive there quite often. Um, this is me uh, just a few days ago. So this is pretty much all the pictures you see are taken by what you're seeing right here, um, including the camera that we're also seeing right here that just looks like a enormous machine gun or something. Um, all right, so jumping right into things, this is about diving. So let's start to kind of talk a little bit here. Uh, has anybody here been scuba diving before? All right, a handful of people. What about snorkeling? Has anybody ever been snorkeling? Has anybody never been in the water ever, ever at all? <laughs> One person, bathtub, nothing, you know, showers. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, so we've all at least showered. All right, so we have common ground here. All right, that's at least a good start. In Euro BSD, can't we didn't have that because it was Europe. So there were people who had never showered before. Um, okay, so in terms of the people who have been diving, just to gauge how many people kind of know about things, uh, recreational diving? Has anybody ever been technical scuba diving, like decompression diving? No? All right, so no decompression diving. All right, that's fine. Um, again, if you guys want to know what the pictures are, just ask. This is a... Uh, it's about this big, maybe. Uh, we like really small things in, in uh, Malta because deep, being in the Mediterranean, we don't really have big fish. So there's really no big fish to take pictures of, at least near the shore. So we take pictures of very small things. Um, before I actually talk about the technology part, I just wanted to explain what I mean when I say diving because I'm going to be talking about different kinds here. Um, throughout, we're going to see examples of technology used in four categories of diving. One being snorkeling, which most people are familiar with. The other one being recreational scuba. And if you've been scuba diving, that's the one you're going to know about. Uh, technical scuba, I'm going to talk about because we get a lot more computers in technical scuba. Uh, free diving, we're also going to talk about a little bit. I don't think there are any free divers here. Free divers? No. Um, which is basically kind of extreme snorkeling. Uh, in all of these, we're going to be talking about the technology, a lot of camera work, dive computers, the planning involved in it. So, um, uh, snorkeling is, we all kind of know what snorkeling is, right? You're on the surface, you've got a little tube that's sticking out of the water, you're breathing through that, you're looking down pretty straightforward, right? Snorkelers, who's been snorkeling again? Most people? Who's never been snorkeling? Guys, I've never been snorkeling. It's a lot of fun. I recommend it. Get in the water. Who doesn't live near any water? Oh, okay. That's probably a <laughs> lot. <laughs> well, you can do it in your bathtub. My nephews do that. And they get really excited. I tell them we're going to go someplace to go diving, and I get pictures of them, like in the bathtub with a snorkeling. It's the absolute cutest thing ever. But they told me not to use any of those pictures, so we don't have them. Um, when we're snorkeling, generally, all we're really carrying is nothing at all. But if you're snorkeling a lot, you probably have a wristwatch on that's, you know, maybe even a diving watch. And probably a camera too. I'm just going to assume that we're taking pictures underwater in a lot of these pictures. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about cameras a lot. Um, <clears throat> recreational scuba diving. This is the most common that we have when you go out to go scuba diving. Generally, you're going to be recreationally scuba diving. And what means recreational versus technical is something we'll talk about a little bit later. But more or less, it uh, is whether you're having forced decompression stops or not. So if, if that does not mean anything to you, you've never been technical scuba diving. Um, this, by the way, is right around the corner in Malta. Uh, everything is around the corner in Malta, though, because it's a tiny little island. So really, the other end of the island, the other end of the country, is you know a long hike away by foot. 
<clears throat> Technical schoolers when we start to get a lot of these guys in the mix right here, so a lot of the tanks. Um, incidentally, if the picture is of me, it's usually my dive buddy taking the picture, otherwise it's me taking the picture, um, this being my dive buddy. So we have a lot more computers in here, and I'll show you some pictures later of just how many computers are involved. And of course, OpenBSD is going to be involved in all of that, which is really great. Uh, free diving is the last one, and that's basically the snorkeling where you take a really deep breath, and you dive down, you stay down as long as you can, and you try to come up after that. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, when people snorkel, they might free dive a little bit, just you know, you just dip down a meter or two. Uh, what's the difference between free diving and snorkeling? I don't. I guess it's if you go down to where your ears hurt and you equalize, that could be at that point you're free diving. Um, so, who goes hiking? Like hiking people. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm gonna try to find middle ground here by comparing it to some. Hiking terminology, and I had to look all this up. Uh, this is what I think of when I think of land people. <laughs> so when, when somebody said we were going to Ottawa and to Canada, this is more or less what comes to mind. Uh, you know, it's got stuff. <laughs> so for snorkeling, this is kind of hiking, right? And, and you know, this language, I, oh, sorry, I actually had to look up on, uh, on the Wikipedia to understand the different kinds of hiking that people have. And they all different, you know, degrees of difficulty. Uh, like with skiing, you know, you got black diamond and all this stuff. So it's similar for hiking. So snorkeling is like hiking, where you're just kind of, you know, meandering and going around through the woods, um, having a good time. I assume that everybody's been hiking. A recreational scuba is when you are in a bit more hilly terrain and you are trekking. So at that point in time, I think you actually have to walk a little bit sometimes. Maybe even use your hands and knees. Uh, to get around a little bit. Uh, when I think of trekking, I think of you know, these kind of nice landscapes, some rocks and boulders you have to scramble over. Technical scuba at this point would be mountaineering. Um, who's been mountaineering? Don't you have like sometimes even oxygen tanks and everything? No, that's like that really hardcore. Insane. All right. Well, that would I'm be technical insane. scuba. Yeah. Who's, who's done really hardcore mountaineering with, uh, you know, I don't even know what gear you would have there. Tanks and stern faces and frostbite and stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. Well, that's. <laughs> What's that? Don't eat mountaineering. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and there are bears, I'm sure. I, I kind of put some warnings down here, you can't see it. Uh, so most of my jokes are in a small font because I don't know if they're funny. I'm not very confident. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, free diving is rock climbing. That seemed like a pretty fair approximation because a lot of people have been hiking, a lot of people even do this via and stuff. But when you're actually rock climbing, that's where you can fall and die. And uh, with free diving, it's the opposite where you fall and then you try to come back up. Where else you die? So, how, you know, where is the technology here? Because when we think of scuba diving, we probably think of wearing tanks, probably think of uh, wetsuits and uh, you know, stuff like that, but where are the computers? Uh, so that's going to be this section. This is a, a Pratina Peregrina, I think. And also, any, any picture you see that's really up close like this is uh, probably this being in real life. And probably there are like 30 shots behind it just to get it in focus. So this is what, when I think technology, generally I'm thinking the most of cameras. So we're going to hear a lot about photography and camera work. In this, uh, in this presentation. Who's a photographer? What well, takes a lot of pictures? Do you guys do editing on, on your BSD machines? Yeah, so you're familiar with, with the tools that are out there more or less. That's good because we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, the photography is really important. Of course, not everybody who does scuba or free diving or snorkeling does photography for the sake of argument that I will pretend that they do. Um, but there are still a lot of computers in general that we'll see on the next slide. Uh, this, by the way, this little guy, can you see this? A little like poof, a little purple poof right here. That first slide with that enormous purple thing, that's more or less how big they are in real life. So you, you kind of, uh, this is not me, this is a friend of mine. I think I'm taking a picture of her, but this is what it looks like taking some of these pictures. And I'm pretty sure that some of the photos you'll see are on this anchor, which is a really nice place that we have in, uh, in Malta. 
So this is where we start to get uh, the computers. This is uh, me going out with some acquaintances. I know just one or two of them uh, who are also technical divers. And what we have is actually several of them, and we're not going to talk about this around rebreathers, which basically uh, scrubs out the thing you don't want to breathe and puts back in the things that you do want to breathe. So you don't have tanks. You've got this weird uh, chemical factory on your back. And then we have some people who are with uh, twin sets here. Um, but if you look closely, and it's hard to see, all these people are wearing computers. So in this picture, we're looking at a total of about one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe 20 computers, actual computers, are in this picture. So a lot of computing machinery. Um, and it's simply because the computer helps you not die, uh, which is really handy. You can do it without computers, but generally it's much safer. Um, so where's the puffy? I don't have that many puffy fish pictures. I do, but they're all porcupine fish generally, um, and they're not puffed up, so it doesn't really look like what we know puffy to be. Um, but all this, of course, I'm going to talk about puffy. Uh, it's not really specific to OpenBSD. This is really just open source. So really, all the things I'm saying are OpenBSD. It could be FreeBSD. It could be Linux. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, any other system as well. So. We're really not specific. And where it does probably fit into all this is, first, we have to work with our camera. Second, we have to work with our dive computers. And then we have to take the uh, information that comes from both of these and do analysis of our dives, image browsing, video editing, dive planning, image editing, and video browsing. So there's a lot of computer work that goes into the dive afterward when we're looking at our pictures, when we're figuring out what went wrong. Um, and beforehand, when we're planning what's going to go wrong, uh, and in terms of what we see. Um, so I'm going to start out, I guess, the more technical part of this, and talking about the data and the equipment that we're using here. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yes? We all hear about all that technical. How much do weight does that add? I mean, obviously, you're underwater, so you're more buoyant. But you yeah, the weight? The weight with all this crap. The weight is really, again, it's not, I wouldn't even particularly know because it doesn't matter once you get in the water. But if, so on the very first picture when you saw me sitting there and I had a tank, collectively all that gear on me is probably going to be 40 kilo. Because you got the two twin sets, I got two tanks on my back, the rigging, the back plate, so I'm pulling that on. I've got my decompression tank. I've got this enormous camera. Um, all that is, is quite heavy. When I get in the water, it's all totally buoyant, though. So the camera actually will float upward a little bit. Um, and the tank, depending upon whether it's aluminum or steel, will do the same. Yeah. This is taken with uh, snorkeling, actually. So even if you're a snorkeler, you, know, you don't get out, you're not free diving, you're not scuba diving, there's obviously plenty to see in the water. So do keep that in mind if you're out there. This was in the Pacific, in Tonga. So for the data sources and things, I'm going to talk about is what kind of equipment we use that we're going to connect to our OpenBSD machines, both in terms of getting the information in and also doing something with it, pushing it out. And we have our camera. There's actually no camera in here. This is just the housing for it. I'm using, <coughs> using the camera to take a picture of this. Uh, we have a video recorder. We have a dive computer. We have a pressure gauge, uh, another dive computer. And we have all my hard drives here, and actually the same laptop that I'm using right now. So how do we put all this stuff together? Um, there are a lot of protocols involved in all this. It's a little hard to see this. There we go. So um, how do I connect my camera to the computer? I'm going to be using primarily um, either USB or an SD card. Uh, how do I connect a dive computer? Oh, does anybody know what a dive computer is? Not many, many. All, all a dive computer basically is going to do is record our depth at the very basic. How deep we're going, how long we've been there. And it uses this information to be able to say things like, uh, how long are we allowed to be as deep as we are, given the air that we're breathing? So it's a pretty straightforward piece of machinery. Uh, as you start technical diving, it gets more and more important and you use it more. But basically, it's a little computer that sits on your wrist that's keeping track using a little sensor net of all the things that are going on around it. Um, and we want to collect that information. These days, unfortunately, most of those are Bluetooth. 
Uh, my favorite operating system does not support Bluetooth yet. <laughs> so I have a, a methods for that. Um, cameras often have a little Wi-Fi thing inside of it. So you can connect to the camera via Wi-Fi. They've got their own proprietary REST API, which is pretty easy to figure out generally. Um, dark computers also use serial or infrared to connect. Uh, I've not used either of those protocols. Um, and for a lot of them, they use FTTI. I don't actually know what that is particularly. I just know that when I plug in the USB, it says FTTI. And cameras often use MTP, which is the media transmission protocol, so all of which are supported. So in this little setup that I have of cameras and dive computers and so on, um, most of it is USB, the camera, the dive computers, all this stuff. The only thing that's Bluetooth is the nice dark computer. Uh, and again, that's going to become more and more relevant. A lot of things are moving to using Bluetooth. Uh, how does this actually end up getting connected? Uh, and this is a very common scenario. I've got my laptop, and I'm connecting it to a camera. I'm connecting it to a video camera. I'm connecting it to uh, a dark computer right here. And I'm using this dark computer connecting via my uh, phone. <laughs> which has Bluetooth, and then I connect to the phone, which is slightly less than optimal right now. So if we have an OPSD laptop in the middle, uh, most things are using USB, either by MTP or FTDI. And then I kind of hack around not having a Bluetooth connection by using an Android phone, um, a cloud, and then into the laptop. Again, that's all I'm not very happy with. But. <coughs> um, yes. Is the cloud local, or is it? Are you transmitting data from the ship where you are to somewhere unmanned and then copy it back? So the cloud that I use is, and I'll talk about it a lot more when I talk about subsurface, which is uh, the program that I use to analyze dives. Um, it's basically a repository for Git. It's literally just a Git repository somewhere. I could just as easily pull the information off of the uh, phone with ADB. Right. And and use it directly like that, but because I so don't data like stored on the phone. yes, data is stored on the phone in a in a in a Git repository. It synchronizes it with a remote Git repository, mm -hmm. and then I use my computer to connect to that. So it's, a, it's kind of cumbersome, but it does the trick for now. Uh, where I put the data is actually far more important um, because if we're taking a lot of pictures, you know how huge your repositories of pictures get, right? I mean, I have maybe 20,000 pictures or something like this, in total 10,000, and it's something like 500 gigabytes or 800 gigabytes or something like this. And movies as well are in there. If you're going to shoot a uh, 1080p movie, it takes up a lot of space. So what I actually have, and I've shown here how I do it, uh, I have a, a pair of radified um, external one terabyte or two terabytes, I forget, um, USB disks, and I just plug them in, and I also have like a spare, I have a travel one that I take with me, so that at no point in time can I lose anything. Uh, failure always happens in the field in this, by the way, so you always need to bring your spare with you at all times. Um, this is kind of a very important thing that not a lot of people talk about, is where they store photographic information, because there's so much of it. It's not like a CBS repository of USB code, there's just going to be a few hundred megabytes. These end up being terabytes and terabytes of size. So, RAID is, is very useful. The soft RAID uh, works just fine. I've had no problems. External USB hard drives uh, using soft RAID. You know, I'm sure it's slower, but I've kind of internalized that by now, so I don't notice it very much. It does the trick just fine for me. So let's move directly into talking about how I can send any questions so far before I talk about data processing. No. So what I have so far is we, we know what kind of equipment that I'm holding around with me. I've got my camera, I've got my dive computers, um, and I can connect them to my OpenBSD machine and get the information off of them using a USB with the FTDI or MTP, or I can use this cloud interface, or I can use Bluetooth. Um, but what do I do with it now that I have it? This is kind of the most important part, because I can get all my photographs off, but how do I actually work with them? Um, this is a kind of a bit of a contentious part because everybody's got their own way of doing things, especially with photographs. If people have started out with Photoshop or Lighttable, they're never going to be able to change using Photoshop or Lighttable. Uh, and I'm the same way. 
with whatever's on the OpenBSD. So generally, people just say, oh, I use a light table for everything. End of story. Um, this is another pattern. You know, this is one of those little tiny purple thingies, a little poof, uh, on the other side of the ship. Um, the way that these close-ups are taken, by the way, is uh, you, you basically get what's called a diopter. It's like a magnifying glass for your lens, and you screw it on. And then you make mistakes. Uh, <laughs> and then maybe out of 40 or 50 pictures, you get one that is fairly in focus. Because you move just the tiniest fraction of an amount, and you, it's off into space. Uh, these look like they have a neat black background and everything. They don't. It's just a photo effect where I, uh, I have two big strobes off the side. They generate a lot of light. And I make the shutter speed be really fast so that only what is lit up by the strobes will appear. So maybe there's actually something behind here, but the light doesn't actually reflect off of it. So, yes. um, Are you changing the doctor uh, while you're down? or do you? That's a very good question. So rigging um, is something that occupies a lot more of my time than I care to admit and thinking about because uh, how you rig your camera when you're just walking around like on hiking or trekking or whatever doesn't really matter all that much so long as you don't fall over which you're going to because you're on land and what do people do on land is they fall over and hurt themselves um, and so it's not that much of a question but underwater where you actually fasten your camera might create a situation where you can't help somebody else and they'll die. So you have to be very, very careful with all these things. Um, it's probably a little bit too technical to talk about now, but I do have ways of attaching the camera to myself. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that that matters a lot where, where you're putting your lenses. So yes, underwater, I can change my lenses. Um, I generally would carry with me a big wide angle. And a lot of these pictures are shot with a wide angle lens and a diopter. And I just got the diopter recently. Uh, and that I can just put in a pocket or something like that. But there are all sorts of ways to stow gear and rigging and everything. And it's just, uh, it takes a lot of time. And every bit of equipment, of course, costs a lot of money. Yes. Oh, Jesus. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard this story already? And you just asked me to hurt my feelings. No. Yeah, so. Um, Go on. <laughs> am I bracing myself? Um, so I was in, I think I was in Indonesia, uh, and we were free diving with manta rays, which is just an incredible experience because they are four meters wide. Uh, you have to go down, you swim down about 15 meters in high current, so everything is moving all the time. And they will come all over you. I've been punched in the face by them. I was almost killed by one because they like to, they like to be close to you if you're not making bubbles. I mean, these manta rays are, like I said, they're four meters wide. They're enormous. And they're not scary at all, even though they come at you with their mouths open. That's just what they do. Um, so we were in a cleaning station. And I wanted to go down to, to take pictures. We were still in the boat at this point in time. And I was using a system for my camera where you screw on all the lenses. And this was before. I've since changed things for this exact reason. Um, screwing them on takes time, though. And I wanted just to jump in the water and get started, because I was so excited. You could see them from the boat. They were like shadows down at the bottom. And I was really excited, and I'm like, you know what, I don't want to waste time on the surface. I want to jump in and just go right down. So one of the things you have to do when you get in the water with a wet lens is unscrew it, get out all the bubbles, and then re-screw it, which takes 10 seconds, usually because you're fumbling around to get the screws on. Um, and I just kind of winged it a little bit, where I'm like, I'm going to attach it, but not all the way, so that I won't take me very much time to unscrew it and re-screw it. And apparently, I did not uh, unscrew it uh, or screw it in enough because I do my back barrel into the water and I take my camera out to you know, reattach the lens, and there's no lens. And I look down, and it's maybe just 50 or 60 meters deep there, but too deep for a free dive. And I can see the lens winking up at me 800 euro worth of lens going. <laughs> <laughs> and just, just disappearing into the deep. Um, it just caught the light perfectly. It <laughs> shimmered up in me, a cheery display of uh, betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been left by a significant other in a really powerful way? That's how it felt. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice when you're diving because you can just feel salt water into your mouth and nobody knows that you're crying. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh... Sorry for your loss.
Uh, just recently, I have one more story, and I've got this nice picture behind me, so I figure I can tell stories. Uh, this was just a week or so ago, actually, and I was doing technical diving at this point with just this lens. And usually, I'm having both lenses that are kind of all attached to this camera, um, but I had the same buoyancy in just one lens, so it was very positively buoyant, which means it's pulling up all the time just a little bit. And I wanted this because we were going deep, and I just wanted to be able to hold the camera with one finger and not, not worry about it. Yeah, so it would be buoyant, but it was positively buoyant, so it was always floating up. Um, we did the whole dive, and I got a lot of very nice pictures just like this. Um, we were coming back in to do a decompression stop. You decompress usually at these depths around 21 meters. And what decompression means, you just stay in one place. You don't do anything, and you switch tanks. So you switch your breathing source from what's on your back to this little tank on your side. So you've got tanks all over. And during this process, I don't want the camera in my way, so I will clip it to something. So I clipped it to something, I switch my breathing, and I go to get the camera. And I go to get my camera, and I go to get the camera again, because surely it's there, right? But no, it was not. So I had clipped it onto something, and it just floated free. So I was looking at, you know, multiple four digits of camera float upward, <laughs> not downward. Fortunately, it just floated up to the surface. So I could do my decompression slowly, and I'm looking up and thinking if a boat comes by and hits that camera, I will be very upset with myself. Um, and everybody's yelling at me underwater because usually you swim in, and I'm like, no, I have to stay right here. And I'm upside down the whole time looking up, just waiting, because you can't ascend, you'll die, you'll get the bends. So you have to wait at the bottom, and you're just down 18 meters, and 15, and then 12. And then nine, I'm looking and I see that little bobbing, happy camel on the surface. And I'm hearing the boat traffic go by. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I did get it in the end, so. That's a happy story, I like the lens story, where I cried a bit of tears for many, many days. What time period do you have to take for each It really depends upon the dive. Uh, so as, as we are trained, um, you do, uh, it depends upon your decompression. So it can take quite a while. So a long decompression can be 30 minutes for me. Okay. And that's 30 minutes just basically hanging out, doing nothing, wishing you had a book, um, making fun of other people, um, you know, jangling their tanks and you know, saying things to them. How do you make sure that you stay at the same height? Uh, you're well trained. <laughs> so you've got a computer that tells you what your depth is. Um, and so basically you're down there and you're nice and straight and you're looking at your, your dive computer and it says what your depth is. Mm -hmm and you just don't move your depth. And you train as a technical diver to be able to stay completely horizontal and flat in the water and not move up and down at all. So you can, it's very restful and you know, you can fall asleep but doze off a little bit similar when somebody's there to wake you up. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, can the decompression have any effect on the mechanical current? Yes, it can, um, because you are changing pressure all the time. Um, so I have not, I have ruined cameras by taking them too deep when they were not rated for that depth. That's really not a, that's more of a negative question. But I had a camera a long time ago that was just a push button camera. You know, you can just buy them, uh, you get in the water with them and it says, oh, it's depth rated to 18 meters or 20 meters or whatever. And me being me, I was like, or, or 24 meters, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And apparently <laughs> that depth rating is real, it means something. <laughs> because uh, the buttons just really wanted to press after that, and they kept on pressing and pressing, and they never stopped pressing. So, that was another camera I had to... Uh, I learned to obey the limits at that point. <laughs> that they will break. But uh, the, the cameras don't... I mean, for a lot of them, like the one I have, you vacuum pump it out anyway. So you've got this device that looks like um, some Austin Powers prop that you... <laughs> and you pump all the air out of it, so you're not going to get very much compression of the air itself. So it doesn't change. Um, but yeah, there, there are depth limits to everything. So let's talk about the photography, because that's really, I mean, there are a few photographers here. All the pictures you're seeing are taken by me. I'm not a photographer at all. I like doing it a lot, but I really don't particularly know what I'm doing. Fairly recently did I realize that there's such thing as manual mode, where you can change the camera and not just have it be automatic all the time. Um, and ever since then, it just gets more and more fun, because you can do fun effects. Um, so photography, as you can see, can be fun, right? People are having fun. Um, this is on a, a fighter airplane in Malta as well, which just ends up looking like rubbish. 
So it's got a fancy name, it's the bow fighter, but it looks like rubbish. Uh, if we go down the rock, is there any regrets on it? And some people are really happy when they go down. Uh, what are the tools that I personally use versus the tools that are available on OpenBSD? And I think that it's basically going to be the same as FreeBSD, which is going to be the same as Linux in this regard, because there aren't that many tools. And there aren't that many tools because they're ridiculously complicated to write. Um, I'm going to split this into two components. One is going to be organization, and the other one is going to be processing. Organization means you have 10,000 pictures. How do you look at them? How do you scroll through them? Um, you know, we all probably have, does everybody have like a, a picture library or something on their computers? Yeah, you probably all have a little, you know, either your pictures of friends or whatever. That's not called Facebook, by the way. It's on your computer, you know? And you have to look at these. A lot of people just use the file browser on their, on their computers, which is good enough sometimes. But when you start to have thousands of pictures, you want to organize them in some way. Processing is effectively just post-processing the pictures, whatever comes out of the camera. And it's not as necessary when we're doing land pictures, because we have this thing called light. But underwater, you don't have as much of that, so you have to do a lot more processing. Um, one thing that's also slightly different about taking pictures underwater versus over water is that when we get a picture coming out of a camera, it's usually JPEG, right? That's what we're familiar with. You can't do that underwater. If you just take the JPEGs that come out of your camera, everything is going to be blue or green. So what you have to do is take pictures in RAW mode, which most cameras support, and then you actually have to change the colors yourself so that you re-add the reds back in. Um, you can do it with the JPEG, but not nearly as nicely. You use the raw photo for this. So raw photography and, and uh, being able to process raw files is very important to any photographer. Or if you're not a photographer like me, you're just a guy, anybody who takes pictures underwater. Because if you go below five meters, it's just going to be blue. So everything you take is going to be blue. Uh, evidence by this, and this actually is not even that bad. So on the left here, we have uh, what looks like a green sea turtle. I, I think, I would, yeah, it's a great total. And we've got some uh, pendant banner fish back here. And you can actually see the yellow. So this is okay, this is quite deep as I recall. This is maybe 30 meters, something like this. Um, but this is the JPEG that comes out of the camera. It's pretty blue and green. And then when we simply add the reds back into it, then we get a nice, much more naturally colored picture. So that's not through any effect. This is what it actually looks like. Yes? For those of us who photograph on land, yeah. uh, we get a lot of metadata from our cameras. Do you, how do you get depth? Is that in your computer? I, I correlate them later. So I have, I have programs that I, I just build programs for everything. So I have uh, ways of getting the information off of the dive camera, I'm sorry, of the dive computer, and then I correlate that with the date timestamp that comes oh. from the camera so I can get the depth. Kind of the way we used to do GPS. Yeah, well, it, I do GPS as well, um, but that would not be from the camera. So some cameras do have a depth meter inside of them. Uh, mine doesn't because it's in a housing, so how would it do that? But it's some of them that which actually just don't get in the water do have depth sensors, uh, which are very cool and sometimes even work. <laughs> but the turtle looked like that when you were underwater. Yeah, the, tur the turtle is, is green. Yes. It's not blue. Yes. And it has you know little overtones of brown and red and stuff. And more appropriately, the, the uh, pendant fish are yellow. Right? Yeah. These are idols? No, they're pendant fish. So, but you do see a lot more blue. So in real life, if you go on 40 meters, 50 meters, things are blue. I mean, that's just how it works. The reds are going to filter out, and you're not going to see it, unless you've got strokes. So it's fun sometimes to look at pictures after I've taken them that are taking it down at 45 meters. And all I remember is just kind of dark and blue. And then you get the picture back, and it's red. And like everything is all colorful. So that's actually how it looks. Uh, here's, a, here's a little bit more start, startling example. This is a Napoleon Ross, uh, also known as a, a Maori Ross, sometimes they call it that, or Maori Ross. And here again, it's just bluish. This is not even that deep. This is probably, as I recall, 20, 25 meters. Um, and then, you know, this is just with uh, post processing and changing the color values. And we have all these beautiful colors that are coming out of it. Same picture. So the, the results are dramatic. If you're going to be shooting pictures underwater, Always use raw mode. Never, never use JPEGs. You can adjust the color profile some, on some fancy cameras to say, I'm diving, you know, do some fancy things. That's just going to do this, though, and probably not as well, because it's going to change depending upon how deep you are. The deeper you go, the less you have red. 
Yeah, another example. Um, this is probably one of the nantes that tried to punch me in the face. And here, again, it's just kind of dark, and uh, in this case, it's greenish. I found that the more green it is, usually the more sediment in the water. Uh, as I recall from this area, this was in Indonesia. Uh, this is where the lens was lost, by the way. Probably before lens being lost, because I'm probably happy. Um, <laughs> but you don't get any of really the grays. All the, the sea grass is red, basically. So this is without strobes, too. Um, another thing to talk about is cleaning up pictures. Now, I generally don't like cleaning up pictures. I think that's kind of dishonest. But um, what you see underwater versus what you see in the pictures is often very different because the, the, the garbage in the water, the sediment, doesn't really show up when we're looking. But when you take a picture and the strobe goes off, all of a sudden you see dust into it everywhere. It's called Pascal. So on this particular picture, you can see in the picture itself all this stuff, right? There's little, little gunk everywhere. And that's just stuff in the water. It's little sediments, it's stuff. So what you can do is you, you can post-process that out with a Gaussian blur, and it goes away. Is that honest? I don't know. I'm just showing you an example. Um, but it does make the pictures a little bit more uh, nice, right? Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that when you get a JPEG out of your camera, it has been sneaky. Uh, it sharpens the images, and it usually corrects for lens distortion just a little bit. So whenever you get a JPEG coming out of a nice camera, it has already been post-processed. It's just not telling you. That's it. So when you get the raw file out, you have to do that yourself. And we can see in this one, see it's a little, it looks soft. Never mind the red, right? I mean, it looks a little soft. And here, it's hard to tell because this is not fully in focus. It's more crisp. And that's just because it's not sharpened at all. So you have to sharpen it just a tiny bit to get the same level of uh, Clarity. So we're talking about a lot of tools already, right? We're talking about color correction, sharpening, maybe some despeckling that's going on there, uh, all of which you can do on OpenBSD. Uh, I should note again, all the pictures you're seeing were post processed on OpenBSD. Uh, but let's start with photo organization. So who I use Shotwell. Um, I've been using Shotwell for a few years, and I, that's a very disgruntled few years. Um, although it's getting better. So Shotwell is GNOME's. I think it's GNOME's uh, photo manager. And it does what I want it to do, which is allow me to kind of put things in categories and events and look at them like that. Um, there are, so the pros are that it's what we expect, right? You open it up and you can see on the left hand side you have folders or whatever. And then you can have your pictures. The cons are that it crashes and it's ridiculously slow. And it does things. I don't know what it's doing, but it's using the processor to do something. And I'm not able, you know, I don't really actually know what's going on there, but when I start it up, it's just doing something. Um, some alternatives to this are, um, so how do you pronounce this? G-E-E-Q-I-E, Geekui? -E -E Geekui, -E something like this. Yeah, I'll use this as well. Um, it's fast. Um, most of the big photo editors, like your know, dark table, Digicam, et cetera, all have some sort of photo organization in it. Um, one of the things I think that a lot of these programs suffer from is they try to be over general. So you'll have a photo processing application that also tries to be your organizer, and it also tries to do raw editing, and it also tries to do exporting, and it also tries to do geolocation, and they try to do everything. Um, and you know, generally, because it's an open source, it's one guy. And usually one guy is good at one thing, uh, not necessarily all the same. So I prefer to have things separated out. Um, for the raw editing, I'm a little bit old-fashioned. I like UF Raw, which is this really old piece of software. And it does only one thing, which is to let you do the color correction. Uh, and that's all I need it to do. So that's what I use. Um, I like it. It has never crashed on me, ever. Now, I mean, that's amazing, considering how much my own stuff crashes. It never crashes. Um, so it's very, very uh, stable. It has all the features that I want. Um, this is, again, only for raw editing. There are alternatives, like raw therapy. Who's, who uses raw therapy? I've not even been able to make it start up. It crashes all the time. Um, Digicam is a really big and powerful one for KDE. Um, I've used it, but it's a little too slow for me. Uh, Darktable is probably the most popular, and also it's just very slow. So the reason I don't use a lot of these other ones is because I don't like to open them and wait. I like when everything is very snappy and fast. This one is. For processing, I use the GIMP. 
Uh, now, a lot of these other um, programs like Digicam, like Raw Therapy, Darktable, they have support for doing processing inside of it. Um, I just like to have these split out. There's no particular reason why I, I, I find them more comfortable like that. Um, and I, you can't really see it, but actually, I have cleaned up this particular picture. You'll notice that around it, in this blue area, there are not speckles everywhere. Mm -hmm. This was in Africa, as I recall, and the water quality is terrible there. The visibility is awful. So it's nice to be able to speckle things a little bit. Um, so one last thing I talk about is how we can do our own thing. Because being all probably, who here is a programmer? Yeah, being programmers generally here, um, a lot of us you know how to use these tools in code, and there are a lot of options that we can do. Um, libgphoto lets us actually access the images that are on our cameras. Uh, libraw, uh, like libjpeg or libpng, lets us access the uh, raw files themselves. Uh, there's an awesome library called LensFun that has stored the parameters for a lot of common lenses. So you can change the distortion that every lens has so that it's basically straight. It's a really, really nice library. Not many people talk about it. Uh, then there's the metadata tools. We have kind of command line tools like Image Magic, which I use a lot. So there are lots of things that we can do if we want to actually uh, edit photos programmatically. So if anybody is going to be writing some sort of a tool to do photo organization, anybody is thinking of doing that? <laughs> I'm trying to find a face to. Yeah. Yes, you! But You're going to write a tool. It. It's already done. What, what's it called? I use SXID with the O option and direct. XSID? SXID. XSIV. And the O option, you can select pictures and it'll print the name, the file names to stand it out. And then you can say MV, um, the output of that to the directory that it's going to go to. That's ridiculously complicated sounding, but I like it. Because <laughs> I, I like to click. You know, I least have a click. click. Like you know, I, I got to see them all. See, but this is the great thing is that no, we can I all. XXID shows them, and then you press M to select. Them. Ah, I understand. Yeah, this it sounds like GQE is very similar. It's got a very simple mm -hmm. interface for looking at things. Uh, but suffice to say, there are a lot of different options that we have. Um, somebody is going to build one. one. It, it, I am full. I can't do anything right now. So somebody else is going to have to do it. Somebody who doesn't have, like, you know, Antoine? I already did it. Actually. You already did it. All right. I want to see it. Um, videography, I don't know as much about this. I don't, I'm not a very good videographer. Um, this is me. I'm getting punched in the face. Uh, I have a lot of pictures getting punched in the face by animals. You never touch animals, by the way, underwater. It's really their bottom. Um, but sometimes they really want to touch you. And there's nothing you can do about that. Um, this is a good example of a, what looks like a southern stingray. Um, and I'm not wanting to be touched. <laughs> this was a no-touch moment, and I was a little violent. Um, I got over it eventually, but um, yeah, this is uh, right in the face. Um, I think to date I've been punched in the face by stingrays, mantas, whales. Um, never a dolphin, but I'm waiting for that one. <laughs> so I'll be too slow sometime. And it's gonna... Right, so this is me taking a video on with a GoPro, it looks like, and uh, just maybe didn't want to be videoed or something. I didn't, I didn't get consent from it, so it didn't get consent from me. Uh, who's done video editing on OpenBSD or any of the BSDs? What did you use? I have a Vempeg. Okay, Vempeg. Uh, all right, also. Um, yes? <laughs> Has anybody done uh, graphical editing? Yeah. With FMFA? Image Magic. Image Magic. Oh, wait, you mean? For video. Still. For videos. Can you give an example of what that would be? Um, like uh, this when we're clipping and splicing and putting things in. OK, also. All right. Uh, I'll get to FMFA because that's a big one. Um, for video organization, we're kind of in the same boat, is that it's actually even harder because the thumbnails are not just a little picture. And this is what video organization looks like on ShotWell. Hmm. <laughs> it needs work, you know? Maybe things have changed since I took this picture, but probably not. So I'm going to talk briefly about organizing and processing. The only tools that are graphical, and I'll talk about FFmpeg, are Kden Live and Lives. Uh, I really wanted to use Lives, but I wouldn't even start up. I don't think it does still. So for video processing, that's just, and I'll show this video later, because uh, it has puffy multiple puppies in it. Um, 
Uh, keep in mind, it's nice. It works fine. You can do color correction in it now, maybe. I think. Uh, there was some uh, work done earlier with on the ports tree I saw about frail plugins or something. Um, but anyway, it's a nice tool. It only crashes sometimes. <laughs> so for, for uh, you know, uh, that's nice. Video organization is just a crapshoot. I'm not going to talk about it. So development, um, I've actually done a fair amount of fun development uh, with videography to do things like I want to take some video that I have which has a starting date and I want to show in the top left hand corner what depth I was, what time it was, and what pressure I had in my tanks. And then you can use things like FFmpeg and script them all together. So there are a lot of tools you can use. They're a lot of fun. Um, and they're all very complicated. But uh, ultimately, you can, you can have a lot of fun with these. Um, and that's actually my favorite, is where you have videos and you have your depth, tank pressure, maybe stack rates or something like this, all in the corner. So the last um, technical piece is the technical piece is going to be about the dive computers themselves. Um, here we have a dive computer right here. Mine looks roughly the same. So for dive computers, these are where it gets really technical. Um, I'm not going to talk because I don't think anybody's used a dive computer here. But basically, uh, what we do with dive computers are two things. The first one, or the software that interfaces with the dive computers, we plan our dives. And the second one is when we're going to do our analysis afterward. Planning dives is just absolutely important in order to understand how deep you can go with the gas mix you have, how long you can be down there before you die, uh, preferably not getting to that point, how long you need to decompress. So you need to plan everything out beforehand. We've got an expression, you plan the dive and you dive the plan. So everybody talks about what the plan is going to be, then you get in the water and you do exactly that. Um, it's very, very structured. Oh, because people's lives are at stake. Um, subsurface is something that I imported into uh, uh, into OpenBSD ports I think a year or two ago, so it's all there. Um, and it can do everything. So it does the analysis, it does the planning, everything's very graphical. It's a nice piece of software. I'm yet to have a crash. Um, again, planning is something that we used to say, here, here are my gas mixes, here's how deep I want to go, here's how long I want to be down there, compute how long I need to decompress, make sure I have enough air for that all these sort of things to make sure that we come out of the water a lot. Um, the analysis is when we're looking back over the dives we've done, and maybe you want to see how deep we were, what we did, how much we were breathing, and I do this quite a lot. I say, given what I was doing at the time, how much air was I consuming? And as a photographer underwater, this is really important, because I've learned, for example, that if I'm taking pictures of little things, I breathe a lot more, because I'm focusing so much on a viewfinder in front of me that I'm not thinking as much about breathing calmly. Yes? It also includes um, radius, uh, more or less the area you're going to stay in, or do you give yourself a lot more freedom to go? Um, the, the, uh, the, the cardinality in that regard is not important, it's depth, it's all the only things important. So you will talk about where you're going to go, generally as well, so that's part of the plan, is saying let's go here, let's go there, but usually the plan is uh, when we need to turn around, what's the pressure we need to do this, how much time we're going to be here, what you're doing when you're there is not as important. But generally, a, a usual deco dive is maybe an hour to an hour and a half. So you can't really like, go jaunting around town too long. Uh, and if there's a current, you're just going to go with that current one way or another. You're not going to fight it. And there's also a lot of development here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about who invented these tools, but you all know who they are. Um, there are a lot of notable divers in open source. Uh, I think Kirk Kusick is a diver. Uh, I talked to him a little bit before. Um, and some divers you might know, this is one of my favorite pictures, is, uh, do you guys know who this guy is? It's Linus Torvalds. Linus Torvalds is a, is a very well-known diver. Um, he has thousands of dives. Uh, Dirk Hondel as well. These two gentlemen together actually made Subsurface the program. Um, Jeff Trison, really great guy. I think he's based out of the Netherlands. And he is the principal maintainer and developer of, of LibDive Computer that is essentially used by all dive computer companies to interface. So it's a really popular piece of software, uh, all GPL or LGPL, from what I understand. Um, and you can see, again, the amount of camera work we have here. There are huge cameras when you get underwater. So we are right about out of time. So first, I'd like to thank the uh, photographers in this. Uh, Myself and my dive buddies, me and Amy. Uh, here we have a nice big friend. I originally wanted to have a thing of what's the fun stuff to see underwater from big to small. This is one of the big ones. Yeah. 
to humpback whales. And if you think about post-processing, all of this stuff right here probably had little bits and little thingies in there, so a little decycling goes a long way. Um, there are a lot of models in these. Uh, I'm in one or two of them. We have my nephews in them. A lot of my diabodies from Malta are in them. Uh, here we have another Flavalina Aphenis. I did not name them, so my anonymous models are this big. Probably dead by now, too. They don't go very long. That's a little Jimmy or really story. Um, I'd also like to thank the BSD can organizers for getting me out here. And uh, I dive a lot with a company called Divewise in, uh, in Malta, and they've just been very good with training me properly. This is, you see this wingtip right here? Where do you think that wingtip is going? <laughs> it's going right toward my face because they see me and they're like, ah! Yeah, we, we gotta show this guy. Uh, but they're really beautiful. Um, and this picture is simply for Bob to have another picture of uh, two Flavalene together. And what do you think they're doing? <laughs> Making more. <laughs> Making more. Bob is just for you. So cool. there we go. Um, and there's a final slide. And, and asking the question of where, where is Puffy? So we have uh, I found a nice pair of very kind and gentle puppies who wanted to spend some time and talk with me. Um, they look very different when they're not puffed up. These are porcupine fish, um, and they're very friendly. If they're not going away from you, they're going to generally hang around and spend some time. I think this is all free diving, so they're much more friendly in that regard because you're not going, <laughs> which would be scary and was scary right now when I did it too. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you very much, everybody.